I want to do today is, is um, three things. I want you to think about the story of the extinction of the dinosaurs. If you know that story of the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, you know that uh, for, since 1980 or so, there's, there's this story that, that a gigantic meteor has hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65.5 million years ago, um, and that it threw up a huge cloud of dust, and that, and that part of that story is often that the hiding behind a rock somewhere was a little mouse or, or a little mouse-like organism or a little uh, insectivore or some small mammal that was sitting there. And, the, and after the dinosaurs went extinct, it opened up the door for mammals to be able to take over the world. Um, and so I want, to, I, want to think of, I want to ask the question, is that story true? To what extent do we think it's true? Um, how did that story come to be? Um, and, uh, and what are the modern controversies regarding that particular story? Okay, and I want to, first I want to emphasize that I'm going to be talking mostly about placental mammals, that is mammals with the placenta. I'm going to mention the other mammals too, but we think about that story and most of my talk is going to be focused on placental mammals. And I've shown you a picture of a few, I want to show you mammals that you may not know what they are or haven't thought about them much. Um, this is a pangolin, it eats ants and lives in Africa, but it's not related to anteaters. Okay, so, and that's, that's one example, I'll talk about pangolins a little bit more. And this is a kalugo, which is sometimes called a flying lemur, lemur but it's not a lemur at all. Um, and I'll talk about, and I actually have published a paper about, not exclusively about kalugos, and I had that, not that much to do at all with the analysis of the data, but I have published a paper that includes kalugos, so I'll talk a little bit about that too. And I want, here's the naked mole rats. These are rodents. They were mentioned in the announcement, so I'll, I'll mention them in a second. They're pretty remarkable. And it brings up the topic of moles. And moles in mammal phylogeny are remarkable because they're a textbook example of convergence. And the more we know about the relationships of, of mammals, the more we know that um, moles are just this great example because not only do we have a marsupial mole, that is a, mars a mole that has a pouch that's related to kangaroos, we have a real mole, which is, uh, this is a European mole, but there's moles that you might find around here. But there's also African moles that are completely unrelated to those. They're more closely related to elephants. So moles are a remarkable example of convergent evolution. Uh, and then the naked mole rat itself isn't even a mole, it's a rodent. So um, that's, that's uh, sort of amazing. So again, I want to start with the human history of the story of placental mammals conquering the world. That's, that story I talked about of the meteor hitting the earth and the dinosaurs getting ex becoming extinct has a long history and it's interesting. And what's remarkable about this history is that the, the longer it goes on, the more dramatic the story becomes actually. And in fact, last year there's been increasing evidence that the dinosaurs in Montana, a detailed study of the timing of extinction shows that the extinction of the um, dinosaurs in Montana at least <coughs> was within 32,000 years of the, of the meteor hitting the earth. So it's, it's actually strengthened the story as time goes on. It started off as sort of a vague story, and that's what I want to talk about, because it's pretty interesting. I want to spend a good deal of time talking about mammal diversity. Um, that is just giving a, a slideshow, mostly from, I tried to get as many images as I could from archive.org so I could reduce the number of photo credits so that I'd have to give, but um, just give you a flavor of how diverse mammals are in a way that's organized according to what we now know about their relationships. And what's remarkable is in the list in the last few years, there's been a consensus amongst a diverse group of mammal biologists about how mammals are related to each other. Um, we have a really good understanding of how the different orders of mammals are related to each other. And back as um, late as the 1990s, we had no idea how most of the orders of mammals are related to each other. Now we've got a very good idea how all of them are related to each other. Not all of them. Many of them. Okay. The last thing I want to do is, of course, there's still controversy. And that controversy is focused on Sometimes what we think about is fossils versus DNA, but that doesn't really tell the picture. What might be more accurate is sort of fossils versus clocks. And those clocks are cal calibrated the, using fossils, but also using molecular um, DNA sequence data. So there's still modern controversies over the timing of mammal diversification. I want to talk about that too. So this is overly simplified, because I have to fit all this into an hour. So I just want to, I want to bring up the highlight. So, the, what happened in terms of human discovery was that humans found gigantic mammal fossils that were extinct before they found any dinosaurs. Okay, so if we look at if we look in the early 19th century, there were already large fossil mammals that had been discovered and were in the process of being discovered. And the best examples and the most numerous are those of mastodons or mammoths and giant sloths. So, and two major figures from history play prominently in the discovery of these large mammals. One of them is Thomas Jefferson. Um, Thomas Jefferson um, 
was involved in a scientific controversy in the um, late, 18th and, uh, late 18th and early 19th century regarding large mammals, and that was that um, European scientists suggested that North American mammals were inferior to African and European mammals, and that that inferiority extended over to the people who might end up living there, right? That he actually said that um, Africa has the elephants and had everything was bigger and stronger and better in Africa and in the old world than they were in the new world. And in fact, if people lived there long enough, they might become degenerate, sort of like the animals who lived there. And this offended Thomas Jefferson seriously. It wasn't just a joke. Um, and he went out and captured a live moose and had it sent to Europe to prove that the, um, ungulate, or that the ungulates were larger than they could be in, in there. He had a grizzly bear shot and got it sent over there. And one of the most exciting things for Jefferson was the discovery of um, mammoth fossils in Kentucky um, at this place that's now called Big Bone Lick State Park, which, park, which is a name where you insert your own joke, which I won't insert, but it's a, a funny sounding name, Big Bone Lick State Park. Um, and it's a concatenation of, previously it was called Salt Lick State Park, and after they found the mammoths, they added on Big Bone Lick, which doesn't really make any sense, but um, that's what they did. Um, so that's in Kentucky, and when they found these mammoth fossils, at first, Jefferson thought there might be mammoths in the United States. He might, they thought there might be elephants or something big in the United States, and by the time they'd sent out Lewis and Clark, he pretty much realized that that wasn't true, but he really, at first he had some hope, he had some real hope that there might be some gigantic mammals living here. Um, but they described these huge mammals, and it wasn't until 1842 that the term dinosaur was co coined by Richard Owen. They had found f fossils, but they didn't know exactly what they were. It wasn't until to the mid-19th century they really figured out, okay, these are really different. These are gigantic reptiles that have gone extinct. And Charles Darwin himself was responsible for, for discovering, on his voyage of the Beagle, discovering a... Um, a giant sloth, giant sloth, you can see a person, there's a fossil of a giant sloth, they really were giant, they were enormous, they're extinct. Um, he found one in Chile, there's a number of giant sloth fossils, and he realized even at that time that this giant sloth fossil was relatively recent, and they are, they went extinct um, as, early, as late as 10,000 years ago, they went extinct, um, these giant, this, the one that he found went extinct about 40,000 years ago. So we have these giant mammoth fossils that was followed by the discovery of the dinosaurs, and at that time, it was geologically clear that the gigantic mammals were recent and the gigantic dinosaurs were old, right? And as they found more and more and more dinosaurs and more and more huge mammals, they started, they, all the dinosaurs were old, all the mammals more recent, and they all pushed up against each other to this one point that turns out to be the, the time when the meteor hit, the Cretaceous-Tertiary boundary, the, the boundary between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, these two geological eras is that boundary point. And that's why I said the story actually becomes more dramatic. And there was nothing more dramatic in terms of the discovery of the dinosaurs than the war between these two scientists. Um, this is Edward, Philadelphia's own Edward Drinker Cope. Um, Cope was a faculty member briefly, although it's not he actually disliked teaching and he did as little of it as possible, so I discovered that he really didn't spend much time doing teaching at all. He was at both Haverford College and the University of Pennsylvania, and he did it so that he could get money so he could spend more time out in the field, basically. Um, Cope pu published over 1,400 scientific papers before he died at the age of 56, which is absolutely remarkable. He was incredibly prolific and uh, uh, extraordinarily ambitious. Um, his rival was um, was O.C. Marsh, and O.C. Marsh was at Yale. They started off as close friends. They shared when, at, earlier in their careers, um, when they were in their early 20s. They showed each other fossil sites, and in fact, Cope named a fossil amphibian after Marsh at this point. Um, but uh, in a, starting in 1868, they, end, they started a really bitter feud where they, um, uh, Cope had published a a paper where he accidentally put part of a skull into the backbone of a fossil. Um, and at the same time, uh, Marsh uh, secretly had fossils sent from one of Cope's sites to Yale. And at this point, things got out of control. Um, Cope had dynamited some of Marsh's sites and sent people on freight trains to impersonate uh, personnel to steal it. Um, and so, and then uh, Cope had uh, accused Marsh of plagiarism and other had other accusations of fraud and had his funding cut off. Marsh had, Marsh had friends of the government, had Cope's funding cut off. Um, this was to be an HBO special. It was green-lighted. The story of these two men was green-lighted in April of 2013. Um, Steve Carell was to play uh, Marsh, and James Gandolfini was to play Cope. Um, 
uh, Gandolfini passed away. I don't know what the status of this is, but it still would have been a great um, movie. So, um, and it really, it's, it's remarkable given the first dinosaurs were discovered in 1842 or so, that by, by the end of the 19th century, there were thousands of dinosaur fossils found all over the world, and um, these men had really, during Darwin's lifetime, they had published an enormous number of papers describing all these dinosaurs and really um, pushing it up to that Cretaceous tertiary boundary. So, what is, so here's the sort of iconic figure of the, you have this gigantic meteor hitting the Earth, and in fact, geologists have known for a long time, before they knew the cause or before they knew the, the age at all, it's clear that there's a layer of clay that lies between two limestone layers, and if you look at areas where um, rocks, where um, sediments were deposited in coastal areas, um, this is the result of a slowdown of the formation of limestone from shells, basically the extinction of sh offshore marine fauna um, caused it, so the extinction of shelled organism causes a layer of clay to form. That layer of clay forms right at 66 million years. And so this boundary between the, the uh, Paleogene, between the, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, is a real one in geology. You can see it in the rocks right there without even seeing the fossils. It was something that was set up a long time ago. And this, the fossils sort of filled in the gaps with all the dinosaurs, um, all the dinosaurs below this line and all the mammals above that line. And it still holds true to that day, not, not all mammals. There's a number of mammals that precede that point. But um, that dramatic story um, remains. And it became more dramatic in 1980 when Luis Alvarez proposed in 1980 that a um, huge meteor had hit the Yucatan Peninsula and had probably caused this extinction right at that point. And so we know that meteors uh, contain large amounts of iridium. And if you look at the, if you look, here's the, um, position in the rock, and here's the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Right at that boundary, there's a huge spike in iridium, um, which is consistent with uh, there being a gigantic meteor hitting the Earth at that time. And the more evidence we find, the clearer it is that that meteor struck there. And in many, in, in many, many different papers, independent papers from uh, small little papers on little tiny islands in the Caribbean, um, they find evidence of iridium there, and they find evidence of quartz. So here are um, quartz grains that have been shocked by intense pressure, that have been melted, that date back to 65 million years. Um, again and again and again, we see more and more evidence that there was this gigantic meteor that hit the Earth at the Yucatan Peninsula. And here's a um, gravity field density image um, right at the Yucatan Peninsula showing this, the evidence of this gigantic crater. Again, the crater is filled in with Earth, but, the, uh, but if you use gravity field density, you can see the evidence that, that, it's, um, that it struck the Earth there. So the more we go on, the, the, bet, the clearer this boundary becomes. And it's pretty clear that it was, um, it was the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. That's what most scientists agree. There's a few people that disagree. But if you look at the, the biggest proponent against it, who's a scientist, um, her idea, there's a, there's a scientist at Princeton, she hasn't published anything on it since 2007, so I don't know, I doubt she's given up, but um, um, she thinks that the meteor hit, there's, the evidence is absolutely clear, she just thinks it doesn't quite fit, in fact, it's, it's 100,000 or 200,000 years earlier than the actual extinction of the dinosaurs, and she believes that volcanism played a larger role, that there are lots of volcanoes. So, but most scientists um, think this evidence is really solid. We've got, and in fact, since 2007, we've had a number of things come out that make us think that this really was a causal, that this was, there really was a big meteor and it was right at the right time. Okay, so here's a bunch of dates from this a textbook I'm using in the evolution class, Evolutionary Analysis, was just published this year and has a, a bunch of dates of humans versus other taxa. And the important ones I want you to look at is that at 162, 163 million years ago, we've got the, di the divergence of all mammals from the monotremes, which are the egg-laying mammals, okay? So most of this exciting story doesn't have to do with the monotremes. This is 162 million years ago. It's long before this meteor hits the Earth. Um, we've got, and it's well agreed upon that monotremes diverged from all other mammals a long time ago. These monotremes are all native to Australia. And then after that, 124 million years ago, um, the marsupials um, diverged from the rest of mammals. So these are the marsupials that have pouches. Um, the, the babies, when they're born, are tiny, and they have to crawl into the pouch where they um, drink milk. Um, there's 5,506 mammal species, as that's the IUCN number that's right now, um, anyway. Um, and most of them are placental mammals. The vast majority of mammals have a placenta, and they're in this group of placental mammals, and that's what I'm, I'm focusing on. In case you're wondering about the dates here, um, the dates are, uh, actually, I don't, I don't know exactly, there, there is a particular reference that they got these dates from. But um, in the past, I would say five, five years or so, 
um, there's been a, a better consensus and one of the improvements in evolutionary biology is obtaining more accurate dates um, based on fossil evidence. So the number of fossils we find and the methodologies that are used to estimate these dates have improved to a large degree. And in fact, what's, what I find interesting is that, for example, if you look at, um, here's human versus chicken at 312 million years ago. Um, there's an app called timetree.org, an app you can download for iPhone or you can go to the web, you get timetree.org, you go to the app. Um, here's from timetree.org, I type in human and chicken and I get the uh, average date of 296 million years, the median date of 322 million years, and the expert's opinion is 324 million years and I get a list of references, right? So I can, it's, it's a list of actual scientific references with peer-reviewed papers and I can look at the dates they were published and the actual dates that they come up with and what the actual species that they use. So we can do this for any two species on Earth, and it's pretty, it's pretty neat. It's, it's a fairly recent uh, improvement. It's, it doesn't work great for everything because we don't have dates for every single organism on Earth, but as the years go by, we get more and more. And if you don't believe it, you can actually go to the original scientific papers and you can see how is it they came up with these dates. So it's, pretty, um, it's become more and more rigorous in terms of this dates, and, the, and there's more and more consensus across a, a variety of methods. So let's start with the diversity of mammals. We're gonna start with the, with the first divergence and that is um, the monotremes, the marsupial mammals. So this is a figure from the paper that described the genome of the platypus in 2008. So the platypus genome was published in 2008. And you can see that um, the things that distinguish mammals from, from reptiles really are two things. Um, is lack, well, actually I say three things, I don't know what's not on here, but uh, lactation, that is the ability to produce milk, Homeothermy, which means the, in the sort of lay terms, you'd say warm-blooded, but homeothermy um, is not unique to mammals, but it's a unique evolutionary event because it's also shared with birds who are not closely related to us. Um, and the presence of hair. Okay, so all mammals have those three things and they evolved along the lineage that leads to all of the modern um, mammal groups. So um, egg-laying mammals includes four species of echidna. If you want to see an echidna, go to the small mammal room at the Philadelphia Zoo. They've got one in there. It's, in the, it's sort of in the dark. You might mistake it for a porcupine, but it is not a porcupine. Um, here, and a platypus. Um, there's just one species of platypus. So that's monotremes. Um, when we look at marsupials, there's 334 species of marsupials. And this is a phylogenetic tree, the phylogenetic relationships that are entirely based on transposable elements. Transposable elements are genes that move around from place to place, and when they move around, they don't, just, um, they don't just jump randomly. They follow a copy and paste procedure that makes them excellent markers for reconstructing evolutionary relationships. And it turns out that the evolutionary relationships reconstructed using only these transposable elements matches the DNA phylogeny based on thousands and thousands of bases to a large degree. And it tells the story of marsupials actually originating in South America and then the Australian marsupials being more recent than that. Um, and the Australian marsupials are a single monophyletic group or a group that has a single ancestor and all of its descendants um, derived from that. And the diversity of marsupials, which I'm not going to get into, includes uh, kangaroos and Tasmanian devils. And, and again, what I want to focus on is the, is the marsupial mole right here. And this is a spectacular case of convergence. It's a textbook example of, of of divergence, and I mean that literally because this is from the general biology textbook that we use, um, and this is the textbook example because here's a marsupial mole and here's a, um, a, a, a real mole, I would say. And so they've got a series of features that are extraordinarily similar to each other that have been completely derived independently because this thing is more closely related to a kangaroo um, than it is to this other mole, and this thing is more closely related to um, us than it is to a uh, kangaroo. So these things have really, this fossorial lifestyle has really pushed them into really similar forms. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, so uh, the marsupials are defined by having these, uh, uh, these pouches and the extended lactation, these extended period of development that occurs inside of a pouch where um, they're um, drinking the mother's milk externally instead of internally. All right. There are 18 orders of placental mammals, and this number fluctuates, but it's pretty solid now. I'm saying that this, 18, this number 18 is really based on our modern understanding of the relationships of, uh, of placental mammals to each other. So this is all the mammals that have a placenta, where the um, babies develop inside of the mother, they have an extended period of, of development, and then they give uh, birth uh, to the live young as opposed to giving a, of an egg. Um, and this is thought to be a great innovation for mammals. It has a lot, it's thought to be causal in terms of the success of placental mammals in terms of the huge numbers of species that are present across the earth, the ability to have this 
to develop a placenta and be able to utilize it to protect um, young and have a higher proportion of the offspring survive than you would if you didn't have a placenta. That's the basic idea. And really, the 18 orders are split up into four major groups. I'm going to go through each of these groups. One is the Afrotheria, which is six orders. Um, second is the Xenartha, which is a single order. And then finally, the, the Bora theory is split up into two separate um, groups of orders. And again, the groups are, are phylogenetic groups that are, they are historical groups. You've got the Laurasia theory and the UR con contoglyris, which is a uh, mouthful because it's a bunch of words that have been slowly thrown together. Um, Arcanto is, refers to the, true, is the U Arcanto refers to the uh, true ancestral, whereas it used to just be the Arcanto, which was the ancestral. And then they tacked on glyris, which are rabbits and shrews. So it's this word where they just throw to get, they make it longer and longer until it's hard to pronounce. Um, and we still don't know exactly how these three major groups are related to each other. Um, the evidence is somewhat equivocal. Um, these three groups, uh, these are the three possible relationships and different groups, even whole genomic data sets and transposable element data sets and fossil data sets don't really agree on how these, how these um, three groups are related to each other. And it's probably a very short period of time in which these three groups split apart from each other. But other than that, the relationships between the orders are pretty well resolved. And, most, and uh, many different studies agree on most of the aspects of relationships. And nowhere is that more true than the Afrotheria. And the Afrotheria are pretty amazing because here's a, this is a bunch of different um, animals whose origin, who live in Africa primarily, um, but look really completely different from each other. And yet we know with high degree of confidence based on DNA, based on morphology, based on fossils, all lines of evidence point to their close relationship. In fact, how they're related is very well resolved as well. So the closest relatives of elephants are, Cy are the Sirenia, the manatees, and the dugongs. They don't look much alike other than being overweight, I guess, would be the, uh, the only thing that ties them together is having a fusiform body of some sort. Um, but we've got, the, uh, we've got the elephants being related to the sirens and manatees. And the closest relatives of these two are hyraxes. And if you don't know what a hyrax is, it's maybe um, hyraxes are cute. They look like cute little rodents. They're not rodents at all. They're hyraxes, OK? And hyraxes live in a very similar situation um, uh, to marmots. If you, know, if you know what marmots are in the West, they live at high altitudes, they live on rocks, and they live in these family groups. They make little noises when people approach and they go and hide. And here's a group, a family group of hyraxes living on rocks in southern Africa. So, so when, but it was known that these weren't rodents. These have very different, their, their, head, their, their skulls and their teeth and their, uh, the aspects of the way their bones are put together. Um, do actually link them together to elephants and sirens. So it's remarkable these things just look completely different. You would never guess having looking at them externally or looking at their ecology that they had anything to do with um, sea cows or elephants. So the next group is also a pretty remarkable group of things that don't seem to be um, closely related. The first are aardvarks. Um, aardvarks eat ants, and uh, there's, they, have, they have a couple at the Philadelphia Zoo that I've only seen them sleeping um, but because they're nocturnal. But um, these uh, these Animals are fairly remarkable. Again, they live in Africa. There's a single species. Um, the next group is, again, one of these remarkable groups because it's something called a tenrec. And a tenrec looks like a cross between a shrew and a hedgehog. It is native to Madagascar. But it's neither a shrew nor, nor a um, hedgehog. It's a tenrec. Um, and the closest relatives of tenrecs are golden moles, which are not moles at all. Um, but I guess they are moles because they fit that form in terms of a mole. They're, they're subterranean. Um, I showed you a picture of one eating. They have reduced eyes. They have the increased. Um, they have all the things that, that, you, that would make them a mole. And yet when we look at how they're related based on their DNA sequence data, um, they're clearly closest relatives of tenrecs, and they fit into this group of African animals. Finally, um, the last group in here are the elephant shrews. There's a number of species of elephant shrews. Um, and they all look pretty similar to each other, different size little snouts, different, slightly different colors. And this species is prominently displayed, again, at the Philadelphia Zoo. They put them in there with the primates. So you, if you ever go to the Philadelphia Zoo, you see these things running around in the primate cages. Um, and again, they're not shrews. I mean, I guess they are. They're elephant shrews. But they're not related to other shrews. Um, and they're, they're in this Af group of the Afrotheria. OK. The Xenartha. This is a single order. And this order, again, um, this, is, this order this time is based in South America. These are South American animals primarily. Some of them occur in North America, but they've moved from South America northward. Um, they include armadillos, 
sloths and anteaters. And so here's an unusual um, anteater. This is an arboreal anteater that's found in South America. The large hairy anteaters that you might have seen um, are, don't uh, look as sort of spectacular as this. They've lost their teeth and they specialize on eating ants. Um, there's the sloths. There's a number of species of, of sloths. Again, you can see them in the Philadelphia Zoo, but they don't do much. Um, if they were alive, they'd basically be doing the same things they do in this picture because they don't move. Um, uh, and then there's armadillos. And in fact, here's the cutest armadillo. This is found in Argentina. It's called the pink fairy armadillo, which sounds like it was made up um, in part of a sort of cartoon or something, but it's real. It's a fairy armadillo. Here it is in somebody's hand. Extraordinarily cute, and they're native to Argentina. So um, that's a single order. And again, we don't know exactly how that order fits into all of the other orders, but it's unique, and all these things are clearly each other's closest relative. So now let's go to, we're gonna, now we're going to enter the next two groups, and we're going to start with the Laurasia theory. And the word Laurasia simply refers to the fact that when, when in the history of the Earth, about 250 million years ago, there was a single gigantic continent called Pangaea. Geography was very simple. All the continents were stuck together in a single continent called Pangaea. And when those continents broke apart, they broke apart into a northern landmass and a southern landmass. And the northern landmass was called Laurasia. So they think that what, what these orders have in common is a northern landmass origin. Okay? But other than that, they don't have that. And they're each other's closest relatives. So we're going to start with something that's, depending on who you ask, this is the set artiodactyla, or just artiodactyla. And I'll tell you why, why the two different names in a second here. So the artiodactyla include the even-toed ungulates. These are the even-toed these are the even-toed ungulates, which include it. So if you look at their toes, you look, do they have two toes or do they have four toes? If they are, then they're an artiodactyl. Um, so this includes giraffes. Um, this is an okapi. They have an okapi in the Philadelphia Zoo. This is the closest living relative of a giraffe. You look at their, they look like a, a big donkey with zebra stripes on them, but they aren't. They have, they have the same type of horns as a, as a, a giraffe has. They have a pretty long neck. Um, but they were thought to be uh, mythological until 1901 because they're native to the Congo, deep in the jungle of the Congo. They didn't actually see a live specimen in the West until 1901, um, but now you can find them in the Philadelphia Zoo. Um, pigs are included in this group, so pigs have two, have two hooves. Um, uh, also, our cows and uh, bison and buffalo are included in this group. And hippos. And hippos have a special place because hippos are right in the center of this. If I showed you a phylogenetic tree, you would remember it. But right in the middle of it are the hippos, right? And hippos have four toes. And here's a, hip, here's a pygmy hippo, and it's swimming. And I show it swimming because the closest relative of hippos are all of the dolphins and whales. And this is a remarkable discovery that was made first by looking, again, at transposable elements, these jumping genes that move around, and then supported by DNA sequence, and finally supported by the morphology, by, supported by the... Um, by all of the bones that everybody looked at. When you look at the bones, and especially you focus on the, the morphology, the inner ear of these things, it's shared with all of the dolphins and the whales. And the, the what, remarkable thing about the fossils is, is that the ankle bone of artiodactyls and the ankle bone of whale fossils, that is, there are these shallow water fossils that actually have ankles. Obviously, these things don't have any ankles. Um, they have ankles, and those ankles are artiodactyl ankles, right? So they've got the head of a They've got the head of a sperm whale, sort of, a small head of a sperm whale. Um, and they've got the ankles of an artiodactyl. And they really fit, they really filled in the story nicely of how um, whales evolved. Whales and hippos are each other's close relatives. Whales, dolphins, and hippos are each other's closest relatives. So uh, also in this group, so that was the, that was the set artiodactyl, right? We combined the whales and we've, with the, um, uh, we combine the whales and the dolphins with the even-toed ungulates. And the odd-toed ungulates are in a separate order. In fact, it's not clear that the even-toed ungulates and the odd-toed ungulates are each other's closest relative, which is what I would have guessed, but it's not that clear. In fact, the molecular evidence is equivocal. Morphological evidence suggests that it's true. And this is a much smaller group. It only includes tapirs, rhinos, and here's a, a rhino foot with three toes here. So you can tell these are the odd-toed ungulates. They have one or three toes. So the tapir's got three toes. The rhino's got three toes, and the horse and zebras have one toe. So that's the perissodactyla. Um, and one of the possible relatives of the perissodactyls are bats, which doesn't make any sense if you see what they look like. I'm just saying that because if you analyze whole genomes, you paste together all the genes, that's, that's often the case that comes out. And bats are remarkable. There's 1,240 species of bats, and they're divided into two major groups, and it wasn't uh, agreed upon until the 1990s, maybe the mid-90s, that the megabats, these are the fruit bats, um, the flying foxes, 
um, that don't rely on sound. They rely on their eyes for flying around, and they, they primarily eat fruit. Um, that's one major group. The megabats are the closest relative of the microbats. And the microbats rely on echolocation, and the microbats do things like key in on the sounds of frogs, so they specialize on eating. They can eat the frogs and make the noise. Or here's the vampire bat. Again, you can see the vampire bat in the Philadelphia Zoo in the small mammal room. There it is eating the blood out of a cow. Um, and this is a goblin bat. So this is, these, are the, these are the microbats. But they are. They're each other's closest relative. And for a long time, people, or the controversy was that people thought that the megabats, um, because of the way, because they have binocular vision and they rely on that binocular vision, they have a lot of similarities in their brain structure to primates. And it was thought that the megabats were, in fact, closely related to the primates. And it was neurobiologists who primarily believed this. And it took basically sequencing the whole genome to prove that they were wrong, that they're not actually related, and that the similarities in their brain structure are, converge, are another example, a remarkable example of convergent evolution, probably brought on by having binocular vision. There's certain ways your brain works when you have binocular vision that, um, that produce similarities. OK. So again, now we're in another group. This is, we're still in the Laurasia theory, and now we're in probably one of the most diverse orders, and that's the carnivores in terms of their form. The carnivores are extraordinarily diverse. Um, and we can split the carnivores up into two groups. One are the dog relatives and one are the cat relatives. So there's caniform, and there's, the real name is the caniform and the filiform. And some of these are surprising. So this includes seals are dog relatives, bears are dog relatives, OK? Um, well, dogs are dog relatives, so this is a maned wolf, which is really a fox. Um, this is a ringtail, which is related to raccoons, which are also in this group. This is a red panda, which turns out to be related to raccoons as well. This is a wolverine. These are the mustelids, the wolverines, the badgers, and the weasels. Um, uh, and here's a skunk as well. So all of the, these are dog relatives. Okay, All of these different groups are dog relatives. I did get... Um, these things are actually native to California. I grew up in California and spent lots of time in California. I'd never seen one of these in the wild, except one night driving in the middle of the night um, near Lake Shasta. I saw one of these uh, right in the middle of the road. It's pretty, pretty amazing. But that's it. I've never seen them otherwise. But, uh, they're there. Um, now the cat relatives. And what's one of the surprises about cat relatives is that hyenas, which look like dogs, are in fact a cat relative. They're not related to dogs at all. Well, they are because they're carnivores, but they're not closely related to dogs. Hyenas are... Hyenas are cat relatives. Civets are cat relatives. Um, anybody know what this little cute guy is? Probably not. This is an aardwolf. An aardwolf is a hyena that specializes on eating ants and termites, and so has, a, um, it's, has much reduced teeth, and this is a baby one. Um, this is a, uh, so here's a cheetah, obviously, a cat. Um, uh, then we have also have mongooses, and then there's a whole group of mongooses that don't look like mongooses at all, have, have names that are called mongooses. They're found in Madagascar. They're really bizarre. Um, they're Madagascan mongooses or um, have other names um, that are completely separate from the mongooses that are uh, there. So those are the cat relatives, a lot of those. So the closest relative of all the carnivores, it looks pretty clear, is this thing, is the pangolin. And there's a, few, there's, uh, a number of species of pangolins and again, because they're anteaters and because they don't have any teeth, um, these things were thought to be closely related to the South American anteaters that also don't have teeth. But a careful analysis of the gene that produces an animal, for example, um, those, things have, those things are now pseudogenes. They don't operate anymore. They're not active in these things. And it's clear that it's independently turned off, basically, in the real anteaters and these anteaters. Actually, these are real anteaters, too. But the anteaters that you would normally think of as anteaters are the ones in South America. These things are the closest relatives of carnivores. They're not particularly close. It's pretty far out there, but these are the closest relatives of carnivores. You can see that um, when you look for images of pangolins, you can see they look like they um, end up as soccer balls for lions. That's what I decided. You can see here's a lion um, playing with one. You see that uh, lions must not be very successful, because I saw, I didn't see many pictures, any pictures of lions eating them, but you saw lots of them um, playing with them. So I don't know. It must, it must be fairly effective. The, they're, and they use their scales for re making armor, like real human armor. Um, pangolin scales are made are, uh, pretty effective that way. OK. Onward. Um, the uh, uh, ulipo tef tef oh, I, the shrews, hedgehogs, moles, shrew moles, and <laughs> slanodons. This is where the real moles are. The real moles meaning 
if you're familiar with moles out in this area, if you went out and found a mole, or if it got warm enough to find a mole, or if you go to Europe and you're familiar with moles, this is where the real moles are. I put real moles in quotes because I've already shown you two groups of moles, and they're clearly moles, and these are also moles. So here's the star-nosed mole from Europe, which is uh, related. This is a shrew, and shrews can be really tiny. This is a shrew mole, um, not to be confused. It's not really close to what it is. It's in the same group, but it's not closely related. This is a selenodon. Selenodons have venomous saliva. Um, and they are found, uh, they're ex endangered wherever they occur. This is the Hispaniolan Selenodon. And these are hedgehogs, which are found in the old world. These are clearly the, um, each other's closest relatives. And they're, again, they're not closely related to a number of things that look really similar, like um, tenrex, and they're not rodents. Um, they're not related to other things. They're their own group, their own distinct group. But it's clear that they're um, closely related to each other. All right. So now let's move this other mouthful. Um, the Uarco. Euarchocontoglyres. Okay, so our, um, this group consists of, of of five orders. The two of the orders, the one where the word glyres comes from, is because rabbits, which are not rodents, are the closest relative of rodents. Okay, so rodents have these two prominent teeth that they always have to um, be um, filing down. That they're continually growing like this, and they include. Things like the largest rodent is a capybara. Here's an eagle perched on top of a capybara. These are truly big, um, uh, these are truly enormous rodents. They include beavers, they include porcupines, they include the naked mole rat and squirrels and rats and mice. Um, there are 2,277 species of rodents. They make up about 40% of all mammal species. So there's an incredibly large, num large numbers of species of rodents. Um, rabbits. And pikas, so pikas um, are also in the are lagomorphs as well. There are small rabbits and there are big, huge rabbits, but they're not nearly as diverse um, as the rodents. So the next group of, these, of the five orders, the next group is primates. Um, and I've shown you some primates that you may not be as familiar with. Um, this is the tarsier. The tarsier are tiny little animals native to Southeast Asia. Here's somebody's glove, and you can see they're little tiny animals. And they have songs. They have unique, different populations have their own songs. They have uh, unique uh, territorial calls that they call out, these high-pitched noises. And there's a number of that uh, where sometimes the songs, just like birds, are what separate the populations, even though they look pretty similar to each other. Um, these are the lemurs, which are all native to Madagascar. All real lemurs are native to Madagascar. This is also a lemur. It wasn't known for a while. It's called the eye eye. Um, this is a bizarre looking nocturnal thing. It has a big, huge finger that it uses to um, uh, pull out grubs out of trees. It's, it's arboreal and looks really bizarre. And this is the largest monkey, which is a mandrel. And of course, we're primates. So this is the smallest monkey. This is a um, pygmy marmoset. And again, the pygmy marmoset and the eye eye and the lemur can be found in the Philadelphia Zoo. <coughs> So here are two groups. Uh, so we've got primates here. And the closest relative of primates, it's still not agreed upon. There's still disagreement on who is the closest relative of primates. It's either the colugos, which is this is a colugo right here. The, um, and a colugo look pretty spectacular when they're just moving around, these brilliant pink and green colors. Um, but they're excellent, excellent gliders. So here's what they look like from the underside when they're gliding. Um, so they're called flying lemurs, even though they're not at all related to lemurs. Um, and the other possibility, and this is the traditional choice, are the tree shrews, the scandentia. So these tree shrews um, are, so these two, people go back and forth. So the traditional idea that based on bones would be that the scandentia is more closely related to primates. The other one is that the, um, the, the dermoptera are most closely related, the colugos. And, and I want to mention that I did mention before that I had published on this, and really, um, it really wasn't my idea. Um, this is a paper we published in 2012, and the lead author is Matt Heineke. He's one, he was our our postdoc here, and he's now at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. And it was really, we had already gathered data on the gliding geckos. And it turns out there's a group of geckos in Southeast Asia um, that jump from tree to tree and have a big flap of skin and are able to glide. And there's a bunch of taxa, a bunch of vertebrate taxa that are able to glide in Southeast Asia. And so what Matt did um, was he gathered molecular data, the, the data that we had gathered on the geckos. He, had, he put that together, but that he also took data from the literature on all of the other gliding taxa. So here are the three groups of gliding geckos. Here's the colugos. Here's draco, which are gliding lizards um, uh, that are not related to the geckos. There's gliding frogs, um, and there's gliding snakes. Um, so he gathered um, all of that data on all of these different taxa, figured out what the timing of diversification was, and it turns out that 
Colugos are the oldest gliding vertebrate group, and that they're the only ones that didn't fit this model that the timing of gliding for vertebrates is congruent with the development of these large trees, these diptocarp forests that developed, they developed at the same time. And so it was a, a story of the, of the movement of these forests into these areas is consistent with these, with these big, huge trees um, was congruent with the gliding. Colugos might also be congruent, it turns out. It's just they have no close relatives. And so the fact that they're related to primates and they diverge from primates much so long ago, um, it, we can't really tell um, the dates the earliest date we have has to be very early, but it is entirely possible that they also developed their gliding um, with the development of these Southeast Asian adiptrocarp, these big, huge, these forests of these gigantic trees. So now to the controversy, the remaining controversy. So um, we now have a pretty good idea how these different placental orders of mammals are related to each other. And the non-placental orders is pretty broad agreement. People don't disagree. We know that the, um, that the egg-laying mammals first, and then the marsupials, and then all the placentals. But now, this is from 2013. This is Ann Yoder, who she studies um, lemurs primarily. That's her specialty, is studying lemurs. But she wrote a, um, an opinion piece that titled Fossils Versus Clocks, because the timing. And so the, the, really, the argument comes down to this. Did the meteor slam into the Yucatan Peninsula, and there was a single placental mammal, or, or a very small number, a single placental mammal looking out behind the rock that was the ancestor of all placental mammals? Right? And this is a study published in 2013 that suggests that, that here's the Cretaceous Paleogene or Cretaceous Cursier extinction with the meteor occurring right here. Here's the single hypothetical placental ancestor, and it gave rise to all of the placental mammals. Is that the case? Or, as actually most modern biologists believe, um, is it different? Is it something like this, this long fuse model, where there are a number of different orders that were already in existence when the meteor hit? Um, that then diversified once the dinosaurs went extinct. Okay, that's the really that's the distinction. Is this is this explosive model that has been proposed recently in 2013 by paleontologists? Okay, so that's the fossils versus clocks, or um, people who use the fossils to calibrate the tree using the data from whole genomes from DNA sequences have come up with this long fuse model. This model. Um, uh, was actually in favor by some molecular biologists as late as 2007, but it's been sort of replaced. Um, we don't think that this one says that the Cretaceous tertiary boundary did not have much effect at all, and that most modern orders of mammals are in fact older than that. Um, but now we know this is this is really it's really between these two. This one's been sort of out of the running, and we, so we're now we're down to those those two um, things. So. Um, so the question really, how are the orders of placental mammals related to each other? It's remarkable that how, how far we've come. Um, this is from a, a book in 1991. This is John Gillespie, who was my advisor at UC Davis, published this. This is the only actual image I could find of a star phylogeny. And this star phylogeny was assumed to be the relationship for all placental orders of mammals until shortly after this book was published. In other words, so if you looked at studies from the 60s or 70s or the 1980s, they assume that the Eutheria and the placental mammals all diverge from a single ancestor, and they just diverge from each other. And this, um, and this model of a star phylogeny, that is, they just all exploded, and we don't know how, we have no idea how any of the orders of mammals are related to each other, that's, um, that fits that explosive model. And it, it fits the idea that there were really, until recently, there were not any well-supported ideas based on bones. Um, that, that put these things together, that there was a lot of disagreement about how the orders might be related. And a lot of people thought that this was the best model, this explosive radiation where we have no idea how they're related to each other. Um, that went away with the advent of more and more DNA sequence data. The picture became clearer and clearer how those orders were related to each other. And it really, um, this was really crystallized in 2011. And then again, this is a paper in 2012 where they used, you can see this one fossil cow, six fossil cow. That means fossil calibrations. They, they took a number of existing fossils of mammals, and they used them as, as pinpoints to be able to say, well, how does the whole genome sequence, so this is based on entire genomes um, for representatives of all of the different orders of mammals. So we took, we took of the 18 uh, placental orders of mammals, actually, and including marsupials and monotremes. Um, I think there's a couple missing. I can't remember which ones they are. But um, most of the data, and this is how we think. In fact, this is the model I agree with. And I'm going to show you one I don't agree with. But, Here's the, here's the Cretaceous paleogene or the Cretaceous tertiary boundary right here. Um, there are a number of orders that we think existed at that time. So it's not just one little animal, it's a number of little animals peeking out from behind rocks. But after that point, 
it did allow them to diversify. Okay, so the story basically holds up with whole genomes, with fossils. Um, we've got this story of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary being an important transition point. Not right at the moment, but at least the idea that it opened up all of these niches that didn't exist before then seems to be consistent with the modern data. Again, this just shows the lack of agreement between data sets. We don't know how these major groups exactly, the three major groups are related to each other. That's okay. Because um, this is pretty well resolved. We have high degree of confidence in the relationships between orders at this level. And this story seems to fit pretty well until 2013 came along. And this paper came along where they looked at 4,541 morphological features of modern um, mammals and fossil mammals. And these are paleontologists that did this. So this is Maureen O'Leary, who's at Stony Brook. And this is Mike Novacek. Um, and just to prove that Mike Novacek is famous, he's at the American Museum of Natural History. This is Mike Novacek on the Colbert Report. <laughs> um, you know, so he's at the, he's on, on, on the Colbert Report, which is a um, TV show. So, and he's got this amazing office, too. So the Wall Street Journal wrote, a, I think, an article called The Coolest Man in the World. Um, and I think it was, a, it was about him and another, another uh, paleontologist at the... Uh, um, actually, it was, they wrote two articles in a row, and they decided that um, Mark Norell was actually the coolest man in the world, also a paleontologist at the American Museum. But they're both considered um, uh, very cool. But here's the, um, here's the uh, relationship for the orders. And, it, and they used, actually, genomic data. They used DNA sequence data, and they combined it with this data. And so they got, a, they got relationships that were fairly congruent with what I just told you. The main difference that, that is, produces all this disagreement is um, here's the Cretaceous tertiary boundary where this red line is. And in this gray area right here is 200,000 years where 10 orders of mammals diverge from each other. And when I saw that, I thought, that's when I thought, I, that can't be true. You can't have 10 orders of mammals that diverge from each other in that short a period of time that left behind so much DNA evidence, such a large amount of DNA evidence about how closely related they are to each other. We have very clear picture about how those 10 orders, everybody agrees, how those 10 orders are related to each other, and yet in 200,000 years, they all diverge from each other. If they really diverge in 200,000 years, there wouldn't be enough time for mutations in the DNA sequence to have accumulated to give us that good evidence. And that objection was articulated in this paper. This is by Springer et al., who had published uh, a large phylo molecular phylogeny in 2011. And what they realized was that what, what these guys did not do is they did not use the clock evidence. Basically, they, they used the fossil evidence to set the boundaries for when they thought um, the, the animals came into existence, but they did not use um, DNA sequence rates, the rates of evolution of DNA, to, to draw the length of these branches at all. And if you do that, if you, use, if you actually consider what's happening to the DNA, in this 200,000-year period, the rate of evolution would have to be equivalent to some of the fastest evolving viruses. In other words, the, that humans, that the ancestor of mammals would, was evolving at the same rate that viruses are evolving today for just 200,000 years. And then after that, everything slowed down and went to a slow pace. And that seems so extraordinarily unlikely as to be able to reject this idea that, there, that this explosive model is true. So most biologists who utilize DNA sequences or place any credence in DNA sequences as being useful for estimating ages or dates don't believe this explosive model. Okay? But the explosive model is held on to because it's still true that you find all these dinosaur fossils that don't pass the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, and you find all these placental mammal fossils that don't go beyond that. Now, there are some placental mammals they discovered before the Cretaceous tertiary, but they make, these guys make the argument that those mammals, those placental mammals, which are drawn up here, are outside of all modern placental mammals. In other words, they're placental mammals that went extinct. Okay, that's what they're arguing. So there's such a controversy there. But I think this, is, this evidence that the rate of evolution was so much higher for that short period of time is so unlikely as to be able to exclude their hypothesis. At least that's my opinion. But one of the interesting things they did and what made the news was this. They actually had an artist draw this. They used them to reconstruct the ancestral eutherian, the ancestral placental mammal. Um, and this is a blog that Ed Yon wrote um, shortly after that. And they said, meet the ancestor of every human, bat, whale, cat, uh, cat whale, and mouse. By, and so, um, and this is, a ancestor, this, is, this is not based on a fossil, that's what I should emphasize. People were confused. This is based on a method which is quantitative. It's not just an artist making up sort of a gestalt idea, what, you know, sort of give me something that looked kind of like a rat. This is based on 4,541 
characters analyzed in, in a fairly careful and quantitative way to be able to ask, what does the ancestor look like? What is, what is the ancestral feature for all of these 5,000 characters? So the question you want to ask is, how accurate are these methods that reconstruct ancestral, um, ancestral features? And it turns out that for DNA sequences and proteins, these methods can be extraordinarily accurate. And the, the, the proof of that is in, is, is, can be clearer that in 2011, they used ancestral reconstruction of flu protein. So the, the, they took the influenza virus and they said, what does the common ancestor of the influenza virus look like? And what, uh, of, and what do its proteins look like? Let's make a vaccine based on that virus. And it's effective. They tested it in mammals. And, and so they, they, know, and they can also do this. They can take viruses and proteins for which they have samples of the ancestor. They actually have somebody who has HIV. They took a blood sample early on, and then five years from now, they take a blood sample from that same person, so they know what the ancestor is. And they could pretend they don't know and say, how accurately do they reconstruct the actual sequence? And it's very accurate. But this is not DNA sequence. This is, this is, this is a morphological form, and the rules for transitions between different shapes of animals is not as straightforward as it is for DNA sequences or proteins. And so that's why you really have, even though it's not uh, a, you know, a guess. This is from the actual paper, and you can see here's character. This is a here's a sperm. So this is character 4,278, 4, and this is character 4,274. Right. So you can see that they've broken down. Here's the skeleton with all the characters out, and here's the skull with all their. So they've got all these features that they've meticulously broken down, and they've asked, what does the ancestor look like for all of these different features? Here's a brain. They've got all these different features, and so. This is, and also having to do with the fur and the color of the fur and what they ate. So they actually had, you know, all of these things. So it's not just haphazard. But what I would say is that even though this is the reconstruction of the ancestral mammal, and what's interesting to me is this thing looks like an insectivore. And remember that moles used to be placed in insectivores. Um, and so um, it's interesting that the reconstructed ancestor is, is one of the forms that tends to violate to, um, the, or it tends to occur convergently again and again. This the sort of insectivore form appears again and again. Um, but you ha I, think you, I think you sort of have to take it with more of a grain of salt than you would if it's for DNA sequence or protein sequences. It's not haphazard, but on the other hand, do I really think that the ancestor of placental mammals looked like this? I wouldn't be surprised if they were way off. That's what I would say. Because if the rules of transition between bones and fur and things like that, if we really understood them and we applied them to this method, we might get a very different answer. Okay, so it's interesting. It is quantitative. It's not just a guess, but I guess it may not be accurate. Okay, so in conclusion, there's now broad agreement on how all of the major mammal groups are related to each other. Um, this, is, this is really a, a triumph of, of different kinds of evolutionary analysis. It's a, it's a triumph of, of evolutionary biology, of paleontologists and DNA sequence biologists, and uh, people from all different areas of evolution have come to some very broad agreement about how the orders of mammals are related to each other. And this is remarkable given that in 1991, we had no idea, really no idea how all 18 of the placental mammal orders are related to each other. The biggest remaining controversy is the exact timing of the events, right? Did this meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, um, leaving behind a single ancestor, then gave rise to everything, which to me seems unlikely because you have this, have, you, that comes with the speed up of the DNA sequence um, the rate of DNA sequence evolution that has to occur at that point. Or what seems more likely is that meteor hit, and there were a number of existing living orders of mammals that were around um, at that point, but not very many of them. And this opened up the door for them to, not right away, but through the years to be able to diversify into the forms that they are now. And then finally, my conclusion is, do we know what the ancestral placental mammal looked like? Um, maybe, but I have my doubts. Okay, so that's, that's the conclusion. Thanks.